welcome to the Chief Science Officers Zoom in on Science Calls, where we learn about STEM professionals and their careers to understand the impact of their job in modern life. My name is CSO Vivekraj from Kenya. I'm personally excited to host today's call. So for all of us to enjoy this experience, please mute your microphones and post your questions at any time during the presentation and in the chat box. Let us welcome Julian Morris, the founder of President of Sharks for Kids. Welcome, Julian. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you guys today and talk a little bit about my work with these amazing animals. So I am a marine biologist, which means I've studied ocean animals and I've spent most of that time actually working with sharks. And when I say I work with sharks, these are just some images to kind of show you what that looks like. Um, and for me, it means a lot of different things depending on the day, where in the world I'm working and the different projects. So I do live in the Bahamas on a little island and the Bahamas is a country made all of islands. It's pretty close to the United States and we have a lot of sharks. Uh, you can see the photo behind me. Uh, these are lemon sharks, some of my favorite uh, species. We have lots of in the Bahamas and I've been really lucky to, as I mentioned, travel around the world to take photographs and film these sharks to catch and tag and study different species and also to teach students just like the conversation I'm having with you guys uh, about these amazing animals. So why are they important? Uh, the different species, the different amazing adaptations they have, things they can do um, just to get people excited and interested in sharks instead of being afraid. We hear a lot of really scary things about sharks, right? Yes, they can be very big, they do have teeth, uh, but they're certainly not man-eating monsters. And hopefully today, one of the things that I would love for all of you to take away from this, this quick talk is they are important. Right? They're not monsters. They're not man-eaters. Shark bites are very, very rare, despite what you might have seen on the internet and the television and movies. Right? But they're actually really important for healthy oceans, for all of us. No matter where we live, we're connected to the ocean right? every single day of our lives. The food we eat, some of the air we breathe, the water we drink, products we buy. And sharks keep ocean ecosystems healthy, balanced, and clean, which is important for all of us. So you might not have thought about sharks as being important in your life, but they actually are. And these images just show the top left photographing a tiger shark. Um, down below that is actually tagging a tiger shark. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, at the top middle is actually teaching students about sharks. The very middle is photographing a juvenile or a young lemon shark in the mangroves in the Bahamas. Down the bottom is actually taking students in the Bahamas out to sea sharks. Top right is free diving with a great hammerhead. Down the bottom right, again, is putting a special type of tag on a tiger shark. So, Tagging sharks. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard people talk about tagging sharks or tracking them, but we have special equipment we use to study these animals. And we do go out fishing for sharks. Uh, it's a little bit different than if any of you have been fishing before, maybe with a rod and reel or a hand line. Uh, we have special hooks, lines, and buoys we use specifically for sharks. We set them and then we go collect the line. We bring the shark next to the boat. And we do what's called a scientific workup. This is similar to if you go to the doctor and you get a physical or a checkup. Right? And if you see down in the bottom right image, that's a bull shark. We have it next to the boat and you can see that measuring tape. So think of the doctor, sees how tall you are. Right? We do the same thing with sharks. We're gonna leave them right in the water and actually measure how long they are. 
right? So from the tip of the shark's nose to the tip of its tail, from the tip of the shark's nose to where the tail starts, that tail fin, and the tip of the shark's nose to, if you think of a shark's tail, you can kind of see behind me here, this one, uh, it has a top and bottom part of the fin. If we measure right to that point, right? So we take three length measurements. We'll also measure around the shark, sort of where its armpits would be, if sharks had armpits, Let's figure out how big around they are. If it was smaller, we would probably actually bring it in the boat. We could weigh it. We have special scales. Uh, this is a quite a large bull shark. We're gonna leave it right in the ocean and sort of approximate guess uh, based on the length measurements and the width, uh, how big they are. Um, because we don't want that giant bull shark in our boat, right? It doesn't wanna be in the boat, right? So we're gonna leave it right in the water. Uh, we'll also collect a little piece of tissue. Um, you can think of this like clipping your fingernails or cutting your hair. Shark doesn't feel it, but it gives us the shark's DNA, right? What they're made of, their genetic material or their internal name tag, just like we all have an internal name tag. And that can help us actually do a shark family tree. So instead of um, guessing if mom or grandma is around, because shark families don't always stay together. Mom and dad sharks do not take care of their babies. So if you see a group of sharks together, like the ones behind me, we can't assume that they're related in any way. They might be, but just because they're together doesn't mean they're family. So the DNA can help us figure that out. Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, and especially if moms had multiple litters, just like a litter of kittens or a litter of pups, we actually call baby sharks pups as well. The other cool thing about that little piece of skin, and we take it, it's about the size of my thumbnail. It's not a very large piece. We clip it right from the dorsal fin, that's that top fin on the shark, can actually tell us what the shark has been eating up to an entire year. So imagine if I clipped your fingernails and I knew that last month everyone was eating pizza all the time. Maybe the month before, noodles. Every day, noodles, right? Right, so obviously sharks are eating noodles and pizza, but we can figure out what their favorite foods are. Now, before we release the shark, we are going to tag them. And if you notice on that tiger shark on the left, it's got that kind of silly looking thing on its fin. That's sort of our version of an iPhone for sharks. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that we can get a phone call from the shark or they can go on Facebook or Zoom and, and chat with us, but it does have a mini computer, batteries, and a GPS, just like a phone has. All right, so you can, if you get directions or see where you are, it's the same technology. So the shark will swim off and we can see where it's swimming, where it's spending its time. So hopefully this video is gonna show you a little bit we have the shark next to the boat. This is a big, beautiful tiger shark. We're actually attaching that tag. This is how we track the shark. We follow their movements. We see where they're going, where they're spending their time. Because something like this tiger shark um, will travel thousands of kilometers, right? They, they spend, uh, a lot of their time on the move. And we can never follow them on a boat or swim after them. And it's also important for us to understand, say we, the shark spends time in one area. Where I am in the Bahamas, we have a shark sanctuary. It's illegal to catch and kill sharks. But if they go about you know, 50 miles uh, to Florida, very close, they're no longer safe. Right? They're no longer protected. So these tags really help us understand where these sharks are going, where they're spending their time, so we can actually get better laws put in place to protect them. We also use photography and video to understand these animals. Right? So the top left is photographing a tiger shark. Bottom left as well, a much bigger tiger shark. The bottom right is another lemon shark, same as what you're seeing behind me. And you will notice that I've got some special equipment. The tank that's on my back, that's scuba diving gear. 
with a special underwater backpack. And then that tube that's in my mouth, that's how I'm able to breathe underwater. This is really important equipment that all different marine biologists use to study all different marine life. They might study dolphins, whales, corals, turtles, um, and it allows us to stay underwater and in the same habitat. We can explore their world, see how they're spending their time, who they're hanging out with, what they're eating, what they're doing. And you'll notice I do have cameras in my hands. Now the camera is inside a case made of metal, keeps it nice and dry and safe because we can't just jump in the ocean with our regular camera or phone, it's not gonna work for very long. So we put it inside a case. And just like you're seeing all these photos here, if you've ever seen on TV a show that had animals in the ocean, somebody got in the water with a special camera to take those videos. Right, things like on the BBC or National Geographic or Discovery Channel. Right? So I actually spend some time working on different television shows or photographing for books. And the photographs and videos can also help us tell individual animals apart, right? So we can do photo IDs. The great hammerhead in the top right, I'm gonna show you that video in just a second to finish us off. Um, we've identified in, in the Bahamas on the island I live on, We've identified over 55 different individual gray hammerheads that come in. Most of them have been tagged, they've been named. Uh, this is a project that's led by the local uh, shark lab or research station that's there. And so we go out, we take photos and videos, we can figure out which animals are there every day, how much time they spend there. Uh, it's also really fun to see their personalities, right? Because we can tell the sharks apart. So we have favorite sharks that we swim with they have unique characteristics just like we do. So I think this one's got music. Yep, oh, I'll turn it down just a little bit. And you can see how close they get. So really these photos as well, I hope you can see, I'm very close to some large animals. Uh, the tiger shark down the bottom left, her name is Emma. She's almost five meters, probably just over four, just over four, close to four and a half meters in length. Big, beautiful animal. Emma's kind of a celebrity. She's been on lots of TV shows. The tiger shark on the top right is named Joker. Uh, she's just over three meters. Um, and these are big animals. That hammerhead that swam over my head, probably almost four meters. So these are very large predators, but you notice they're not biting me. They're not trying to bite me. They're just swimming around, right? So there's this idea that sharks are really dangerous or so they're monsters. If we respect them, we give them their space. You notice we're not grabbing them or trying to harass them. Yes, we do handle them when we're tagging them, but not when we're underwater. Um, we can have these really amazing encounters and learn a lot about them. So there's a lot of different equipment and technology that we're using to study sharks. And we do this because unfortunately, many of these species are threatened with extinction. The great hammerhead on the top right that swam over my head, they're critically endangered, which means if we don't do something to protect them, they're going to be extinct, right? And this is happening with sharks because people are afraid of them. People eat shark uh, and about 100 million sharks are killed every single year. So studying them, tracking them, learning more is important for us to get laws in place to better protect them. We have to learn about an animal in order to protect it, whether it lives on land or in the ocean. So this research is really, really important for us to be able to do that and get more shark sanctuaries, better laws in place for marine protected areas so that these animals can continue to thrive in the oceans, which helps all of us. Thank you very much for telling us about your work, Gillian.
It's truly evident you're truly passionate about your work. While we are learning about what you do, participants have left questions in the chat box. But let's start with the questions I had prepared. Who was your mentor as a child? So I think I was really lucky. I grew up in Maine, which is a state in the northern United States. Uh, the next stop is Canada, so it's way north. And I spent a lot of time going to the ocean and exploring. And my parents took me there. So I think first were my parents. They loved the ocean and, um, you know, they took me, uh, they took me snorkeling for the first time when I was eight years old. Uh, so I got to see my first shark in Florida when I was eight. And so that kind of started. And then um, Sylvia Earle has really been an inspiration. She was the first, when I was really young, she was the first woman that I saw that was doing the same work I was interested in because the people on TV, the people in the books that were working with animals were all men. And I, I, so it seemed like this was a job for men. Women didn't do this. And so when I learned about Sylvia Earle and then Eugenie Clark, um, both women who sort of have pioneered a lot of shark research, but also just ocean exploration, um, they really inspired me to, to see that women can do this too. Uh, that's a good answer. So let's go to the next question of mine. What advice would you give to your 14 year old self? I think to uh, my 14 year old self, I would say, don't listen to people telling you this is not for women. Again, it's kind of the same thing, but a lot of times people will tell you working with sharks, being a scientist or being an engineer, things, jobs like that are, are for men, right? That's what, but and I heard that a lot, that this wasn't something, or uh, I wouldn't make any money, um, things like that. But I, you know, if you're passionate about something and you're really interested in it, you will find a way. Um, I grew up in a really small town in Maine, 400 people, very, very tiny. Um, and I just, I knew I wanted to do this. And so I followed along with that. So I would just remind my 14 year old self that you're going to hear a lot of people tell you reasons why you cannot do this, why you shouldn't do this, but don't listen to them. And I didn't, I mean, luckily I didn't, <laughs> but I would just remind myself, um, that, you know, just keep with it. Yeah, thanks for that. I totally agree with you. Girls can do anything. Thank you very much for answering my personal questions. Now let's start with the participant questions. Uh, so the first question is from CSO Dania from Mexico. Aren't you scared of sharks? If not, why? So you saw all those photos and videos, right? That was me. I'm very close to these animals or I took those photos. A lot of the information we are taught about sharks is wrong, right? They are not man-eating monsters. Um, not even talking about crazy movies, Jaws and things like that. I'm talking about it's on the news. And shark bites do happen. They're just very, very, very rare, right? So humans kill about 100 million sharks every single year, 100 million. On average, about five humans die from shark bites in the world each year, five, right? More people die from uh, vending machines, um, elephants, coconuts, taking selfies, dogs, mosquitoes. You know, there's a lot of other animals, cows. Cows kill more people every year than sharks, but we don't see horror movies about cows. We don't see people terrified of cows. Um, Right? And so maybe because cows are kind of cute and, I don't know, kind of furry and they're land animal or something different. But um, I think there's just so much misinformation about sharks, uh, which is sad because they're so important for all of us. Yeah, that's a cool answer. So I, I, love, I love your motive. Uh, next, go to the next question, uh, which is from Kelly CSO International. What are the rules slash regulations about tagging the sharks? So it depends on where you are. So all of the equipment that we use uh, is designed specifically for sharks. So we don't use fishing equipment that you would use for other animals. Um, it's made to make it as easy as possible on the animal. Certain species of shark have to swim to breathe. It allows for that. Um, if we have them next to the boat, 
and they're a shark that has to swim to breathe, we'll move the boat forward so that the water is moving over their gills. Um, and if we're in a certain region, we get permits. We have to get permits from the government to be out there to do the research and report back to them to make sure that we're doing this safely and to make sure, yeah, so everything, and when we do the workup, we, it's a team effort. We all know our job. Everyone knows exactly what they're going to do, and we do it very quickly. So all that information I said we collect, that data, depending on the tag we put on, uh, we'll have the shark next to the boat between 5 to 12 minutes, and then we release it. It's very, very quick. We do not keep that animal for long, and we let it go. Um, but every place we work is different, and we make sure we have the correct permitting, and we're doing everything we can to minimize the impact or stress on that particular animal. Okay, so the next question is from CSO Dania from Mexico. Why do you think sharks are villainized? I think because we're afraid of monsters, naturally. Um, people like scary movies. People, you know, depending on where you are in the world, Halloween, they go to haunted houses and watch horror movies. And, and, uh, and also the ocean is a really big place and the unknown um, can be really scary. It also is sort of, you know, in us naturally because of, you know, when humans were first kind of shown up on earth, it was, Either you chased an animal to try and get it to eat it, or you ran away from it, and that could be a bear or an, you know a large animal. And so there's sort of this innate, natural um, fear of larger animals um, because it meant it might be danger for us. So I think that teamed up with movies and the media kind of plays into that natural fear of large animals, the unknown, and yeah, so people kind of like a monster, right? And so sharks have big teeth, they can be very large. Um, yes, they, unfortunately for them, they, they fall into that. And so I think um, the media has done a big part in really villainizing them, much more so in creating a lot of myths uh, out there that people actually believe. Instead of just saying, oh, this is a scary movie, look at that three-headed dragon, I'm not gonna think that there's gonna be one of those around the corner, but, Sharks are real animals, so people are afraid of real things. And unfortunately for them, a lot of misinformation out there. So the thing is that they are misinformed, right? A lot of misinformation. Yeah. I think the other thing I wanted to kind of add there too is that they swim faster than we do, and they're naturally better swimmers. So when you have the fear of drowning yourself as a non um, aquatic animal <laughs> right and then there's something below you in the water it's just like oh my goodness what is that and what are they gonna do I think that fear even though I'm not afraid of the ocean when I've snorkeled it's it's that whole like oh my goodness it's getting close is it gonna touch me <laughs> absolutely absolutely that's an informative answer and thanks for doing that uh so, so the next question is from CSU Danusha from Kenya. How exactly do you calculate the age of the shark, age of a shark? So that one's a little bit challenging. Um, for certain species, we know uh, from catching them when they're first born. Now sharks can either lay egg cases with a little baby shark hatches out, or these lemon sharks are actually born alive. They have an umbilical cord that connects them to their mother. So they're born alive, which leaves them with a little shark belly button, all right, which is pretty cool. Most people don't know some sharks have belly buttons, which is one of my favorite facts. And by studying them when they're young, we can kind of assess that growth rate in the first year, it's not the same as humans that there's quite a variation between how much you grow each year. With shark species, it tends to be, uh, if they're a certain size, we can say they're about a year old, um, or you know, if they're a certain range, we kind of know a range. Um, but once they get to be adults, it's a little harder to actually figure that out because they may not be growing or have the same growth rates. Um, and one of the things that's not really done anymore, but what they used to do, and it's really one of the only ways for adults is if you guys have all seen the rings on a tree, all right, the annuli, if you cut a tree, you can count the rings to see how old it is. Sharks actually have that 
in their vertebrae, okay? So they don't have bones. Another kind of fun uh, fact, sharks have a, a skeleton made of cartilage. It's the same stuff you guys have in the top of your ear or the end of your nose. They have zero bones in their body. But the cartilage that is the backbone, if you were to cut into that, you could count the rings as well. So obviously the animal has to be dead to do that. So uh, if we have dead sharks, we can easily figure out their age. Um, but really it's something that isn't done much anymore because you don't want to have to kill the animal to learn about it. Uh, that's such an informative answer. Uh, let's go to the next question, which is from Kelly, CSO International. What made you to begin a uh, shark for kids? So I think that students just like yourselves are amazing and you have a really big voice and you're a lot more powerful than you realize. So your actions inspire other people, younger students, or say you see an adult and they throw a piece of trash on the ground, right? If I say something to that adult, their response might not be so friendly, okay? But if you say something like, hey, you shouldn't throw trash on the ground, they might look at a student and go, you're right, and pick that up. So um, your actions, your, your voice is, is much stronger than you realize. So to create a program to give students facts about sharks, uh, resources, materials, videos, activities um, for teachers as well is something that I believe was needed because we need students, just like you guys, to care about these animals. Um, and to, to be able to make a difference. And I, and I really believe that um, students can save sharks and the oceans. It's just our responsibility to give them the tools and the information and the facts that they need to do that and really just kind of empower and inspire them to be able to do that. So that's where Sharks for Kids came out of is just a belief that, that kids can make a difference. Kids of all ages, it's not, you know, uh, and um, can really make a difference and help you know, sharks and the oceans, which helps all of us. That's a very nice answer. I love it, really. Uh, it's a kind of a motivation answer. So let's go to the next question. This is from CSO Chebeni from Kenya. Why don't sharks have scales? So they do have a scale, but it's not a true scale. So it's different um, than sharks are fish, but they're not the same as other fish. And if you look at the outside of a fish, you'll actually see those, those true scales. Um, but sharks have what are called dermal denticles, which means skin teeth. So their actual, their whole body is covered in teeth, right? But they're microscopic. So we can use special high powered microscopes or actually CT scans. So medical tools that are used to look at the human body to actually look close mm -hmm. at sharks. Um, and it's pretty incredible to see that. You guys can check out our website as well. We have a cool video showing you um, the dermal denticles. These protect the shark. They're very strong. They also make it easier for them to swim. And the water moves over them. And if you're a shark, uh, swimming is really important, especially if you're a species that has to swim to breathe. So you wanna make it easy as possible. So not a true scale, but they still do have a covering um, that protects their body and makes swimming easier. Uh, okay, sure, we would actually check your website. And thank you very much for your participation today. Uh, before we close this call, what advice would you give uh, to us as young leaders for our future? Um, I think just realizing how much you can actually do. Sometimes when we're young, we feel like we can't make a difference. We don't have a voice or we don't, you know, there's a lot of things in the world right now, right? Climate change, uh, plastic pollution, uh, overfishing, and it, it can be really overwhelming. But just remember that each little action you take, uh, learning about sharks, uh, choosing to refill your water bottle instead of a single use plastic, um, recycling, and, you know, I know regulations are a little bit different right now in the world with the, you know, the pandemic that's going on, but um, just being aware of, of our actions and realizing how much of an impact we as one person can actually make. Don't forget that. Um, you, you have a voice and your actions make a difference. So um, I think it's, it's super important to remember that, especially when times are a little overwhelming or it can be scary or seem impossible to do something positive, but you actually can. Uh, yeah, 
thank you so much for your answer and thank you for so much and we apologize for the delayed start again we thank you for joining us today uh jillian you are an inspiration to many of us and we hope that you can participate in another call someday as we continue to zoom in on stem cso's please unmute we will close with our motto cso's don't just hope it happens make, make it, happen. it happen make it happen Th thank you thank Goodbye. you guys so you much for having guest. me great thank Thanks, you so much Jillian. take care that was a great call bye, bye. have a wonderful day bye, bye.